Well, good morning. This microphone assembly behind me here is a little intimidating. I feel like if I back up a little too far, it's going to burn off the top of my head. Shave off my hair. Oh, wait, I don't have any hair up there. So. <laughs> now, how many of you played with army men when you were younger? Remember those little bags of green army men? Yeah, there were certain pieces that obviously were more valuable than others, right? Certain guys had the killer weapons, right? They had the, they had the big old machine guns or the little guys that laid down that had the, the little tripod thing on their machine gun. Those were the coolest ones. Kind of the throwaway guy was the walkie-talkie guy, <laughs> right? Mr. Walkie-talkie guy was not much fun. And then there was, of course, the minesweeper guy. Remember the minesweeper guy? And I was thinking about that because... I am about to step into a very large minefield, and I used to not value the little minesweeper guy much when I was a kid, but right about now, I kind of wish I had one. <laughs> I am about to dance right into a minefield with 1 Corinthians 7, and I hope, I hope it will be profitable for us this morning. We have covered a lot of ground, have we not, with regard to the topic of divorce and marriage and remarriage. We have we have looked at marriage in particular and the covenant union between a man and a woman, the covenant of companionship. We have looked at what Moses and the prophets said about divorce and remarriage in the Old Testament. We saw last week what Jesus said about divorce and remarriage and talking to the issues of the heart and the hardness of man's heart. And this week, we enter into what Paul says about divorce and remarriage, the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul discusses marriage-related issues in several places in the New Testament, but I'm going to confine my thoughts really to 1 Corinthians 7. As you know, he discusses it there over in Romans 7, verses 1 to 3, but I think Pastor David did an excellent job covering the book of Romans for five years, and I don't really feel compelled to cover that passage again. We also, uh, there Paul is just simply making an illustration that uh, believers are free from the law. I think it's that simple. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2, uh, regarding the character of those in leadership. Uh, again, Pastor David preached through that years ago, and so I would recommend you get that sermon online. Uh, really, we just want to confine our thoughts to 1 Corinthians 7 because I, I think it adds new information to what we've already said, and so that's why we want to land there this morning. So if you're not there, turn to 1 Corinthians 7, and in particular, we're going to look at verses 10 to 16 uh, this morning, so let me go ahead and read through that. But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Now those are really, uh, it's a tantalizing passage. There's a lot of new information in here for us. We could probably say, I mean, let me just give you a little background. Let's try to land in the context. Uh, I'm obviously jumping into a context by starting in verse 10 of a chapter. Uh, so let me, let me just kind of build the background context here for you. Uh, 1 Corinthians, we know, is the letter to a screwed up church, right? We would kind of summarize it that way, and we would say, uh, my exegetical insight here is that 1 Corinthians 7 follows on the heels of 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. And so that's important for us to understand as well. But the primary context of chapter 7, if I could say it this way, is about celibacy, not about divorce and remarriage. The primary context is celibacy. How do I know that? Well, verse, chapters 5 and 6 dealt with the issue of libertine views of sexuality. 
if I can say it that way, chapter 5 in particular about a man who had his father's wife. Remember that story and the whole church discipline issue in chapter 5? And then chapter 6 goes into lawsuits, and I believe the lawsuits relate back to chapter 5. I think the father dragged his son into the courtroom. And then we get to the end of chapter 6, and you have uh, a discussion then about somebody joining themselves to a prostitute. So the issue clearly there is sexual immorality and libertine views on, on the sexual union. And then Paul starts chapter 7 where he says, verse 2, because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife. Do you see that? Because of that, so now he's going to go the other direction and he's going to address the issue of a Gnostic understanding of marriage, if you will. That is the, the Greek background of the idea that sex, even within the marriage, is wrong. And there were obviously some Corinthians there who were withholding themselves from their mates. And the Apostle Paul is addressing that issue and he's saying the only legitimate reason you have to withhold yourself from your mate is if you are divorced or if you are, uh, if one or the other has left the marriage. That gets you off the hook. But otherwise, uh, verse 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement. So this is kind of where we are here in the book. Uh, there's no legitimate reason to deny spouses sexually unless you're divorced or they have left the marriage. And if you're divorced, and we're going to talk about this, and you're believers, then you need to come back together. So this is the background. I think the statement in verse 9 controls the context, if I could say it that way. You look at verse 9, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Cultural reference, season two opener of Star Trek, Amok Time. How many of you remember it? Okay, there's got to be some Star Trek fans in here somewhere. Help me out a little bit. Okay. The idea is burning with passion. Okay, it's burning with passion. If you cannot have self-control and restrain yourself, even if you're divorced unlawfully, even if you're married, then, you, then the idea is it's better to be married than to be single and to burn with passion. Not everybody in the church has the gift of celibacy or, better said, self-control, right? In fact, I would say most people don't have that gift. It is a gift, which means it's unusual. So, if you can't control the passions, the controlling context would say it's better if you marry than to burn or fall into sexual immorality or other such things. Okay, so that's the background. Uh, I think a lot of the confusion here also comes in these verses, um, importantly, because they don't understand that Paul is addressing two separate classes of people, two separate situations. You see in verse 10, uh, it, actually you can back up to verse 8, you see where he says, to the unmarried, and then he says in verse 10, to the married, and then verse 12, to the rest. He's addressing different classes of people, different life situations, if you will. And so to try to take uh, verses 10 and 11 and the rules that apply there for two believers and, and try to make that fit with verses 12 to 16 creates a lot of confusion. In the same way, if you take verses 12 to 16, which is talking about marriage to an unbeliever, and try to plug that into the rules for two believers then you have all kind of problems again. You have to stick to the context very closely here, and I hope we'll be able to do that. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to see two marital situations, uh, which I think will shed further light on the topic of divorce and remarriage. And the reason why we're going to do that this morning is so that we'll be able to show compassion towards those who, are, who have gone through a divorce or who are contemplating going through a divorce. I mean, the bottom line here is, beloved, we want to have compassion on people that are in a hard spot, right? They're in a hard spot. And the goal of the church is to not tear people up more than what they need to be torn up. Okay? The idea here is to show compassion. We want to be able to help them. We want to be able to bring truth to the situation. We want to be able to show mercy and kindness to those who are struggling. Let me clarify one other thing. Verses 10 and 12, um, you see that where he says, not I, but the Lord. I give instructions, not I, but the Lord. 
And then down in verse 12, I say and not the Lord. Uh, that's confused a lot of people too. That, that means that what Paul is saying is not inspired or not authoritative or something, but that's simply not the case. Uh, the issue here is that the Lord addressed the first situation of two believers, as we saw David spoke to that last week, right? The Lord addressed that situation of what should two believers do? Um, and, and he never really dealt with this unforeseen, I mean, he foresaw it, but the church did not foresee this issue of what happens when uh, two unbelievers get married and one of them comes to faith. And then the unbeliever no longer wishes to be married to the believer. What do you do in that scenario? Do you force them to stay? Do you divorce them because they're an unbeliever? What do you do? So the Apostle Paul is picking up a situation here that Christ never addressed in his earthly ministry. So it's new information. So let's look at the first situation, verses 10 to 11 here. You see where he says, But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. Uh, these instructions are for two believers, two professing believers, and it, it really only duplicates what the Lord has already said on the issue. So I don't need to re-preach what David said last week. I'm not going to attempt to do that. I'm just going to try to bring a little bit of clarity to these verses, okay? Uh, verse 10, the wife should not leave her husband. Um, marriage is a covenantal union of companionship primarily, right? We've, we've said that already. So, so it would not be legitimate for a believing wife to leave her husband, to separate from him. Uh, they are supposed to be man and woman for life. They have become one flesh, and they are to remain so permanently in this life. So because of this, a wife should not, should not leave her husband. Uh, the word leave here is, is from the verb chorizo, and I, want, I normally wouldn't do this, but I want you to understand the distinction in the words here. Um, the word carizo means to be separated. And it's a passive idea here with a reflexive tone. And what that means basically is to separate herself from. Uh, she's not being sent away here. She's leaving. That's the idea. She should not separate herself from her husband. Uh, we've already said this was not a, a common practice for Jews. More common in the Greek culture, uh, there was allowance for it in the Greek community, as David said last week. Uh, historically, though, let me just say this. There is no precedent uh, in the Greek culture for separation as we see it today. Okay, so, so when we talk about separation, we're not talking about a legal separation where the two parties go through a cooling off period and one person moves out and they're legally separated. There was no such thing uh, as in the religious or secular literature of the period. It didn't exist. And so you were either married or you were divorced, separated. That's the idea. A marriage was either together or it wasn't. So Paul also says down in verse 11, Likewise, husbands are not to divorce their wives. Uh, this is obviously what happens more in our culture, right? Uh, the result is that the wife is left behind in an unmarried state. Her husband divorces her. He sends her away. Uh, the word here is afiame, and, and I tell you that because uh, it has the same meaning as carizo. Both of them are words that are used to de describe divorce in the New Testament. The other word that we see in this context, luo, to be loosed from, is never used of divorce. These two words are used of divorce. So that's what, how we know what we're talking about up here, okay? Uh, interesting thing about this word, it's, it's, it's other times translated in the New Testament as to forgive. So context is everything here because it's not telling them to forgive each other. It's saying don't divorce. It's not saying don't forgive. But just to make the point, leaving and divorcing both describe the same activity. It's the same thing. So, two believers without moral grounds to divorce one another, uh, i.e., 
not permissible reasons, as we've said before. There's been no violation of the covenant of companionship. There's been no violation of the sexual exclusivity. Uh, without those moral grounds, uh, then the wife, if she leaves or is sent away and joins with another man, she would technically be committing adultery in doing so. And that's what we need to understand. Uh, and in marrying a new man and entering into a new covenant and, and um, consummating that marriage with the new husband, the one-time act of doing that would be to commit adultery. That's what Paul is saying. Now, look at the text, though. You see the parenthetical there. It says for believers uh, to divorce would be that, they, that their, their objective and their goal should be to reconcile as soon as possible. Now, when he says she needs to remain unmarried, he doesn't mean forever. Uh, we just say that on the front side here. It doesn't mean she has to stay single forever. The point is that uh, there would be the option to, to reconcile with her husband, right? Uh, for believers, divorce should only be considered, if I could say it this way, after all attempts at reconciliation have failed. Everything has failed. There's no other option. We have to go to what we call the nuclear option. Somebody sent in a question and said they didn't understand what we meant by the nuclear option. The nuclear option means uh, you've tried everything else. All diplomacy has failed. We're going to hit the nuclear button and send missiles, and we don't have anywhere else to go, Okay. It means it's a last option. Uh, Again, the parenthetical, verse 11, uh, believers, I think he's addressing the issue here that believers have already, in a sense, separated or divorced. And so he's picking up this idea here in the parenthetical. If she does leave, she needs to remain unmarried or else be reconciled. So uh, what if two believers have already separated, they've already divorced, what do we do? What do we do? Well, this is the answer. There's two options. Uh, One would be to remain single. That's option number one. Uh, Don't remarry. Uh, If they've divorced for non-permissible reasons, uh, then she needs to stay single. Uh, At least until one or the other of the two remarries. That then breaks the covenant, and then they can move on. Uh, The idea here is the fact that the grounds may be illegitimate for the divorce, but the divorce itself is not illegitimate. Do you understand what I'm saying there? In other words, they, they may have separated for non-permissible reasons, but the divorce is still valid. The divorce is still valid. They're no longer married. So all spousal obligations end with a divorce until the two parties are reconciled to one another. Uh, either remarriage or renewal of the marriage vows. Okay? So, option number two, uh, be reconciled. Uh, Provided there's been no remarriage to a different person, uh, option number two, other than staying single and allowing for reconciliation, option number two would be to reconcile. Uh, In other words, if one or the other has not joined themselves with another person, in a new covenant, then it may be possible to bring them back together and to reconcile the marriage. Uh, It's easier said than done, but it's not impossible, right? All things are possible with God. If there's been no remarriage, the two should attempt reconciliation. Uh, I've heard a lot of questions on this. Well, what if 10, 15 years have gone by and neither one has remarried? Uh, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) It's, it's possible that they could still be reconciled. Uh, I believe they should attempt to reconcile. But if too much time and too much water has gone under the bridge, then it may not be possible. It may not be possible. The, the idea here, though, is that the remaining single is for the purpose of reconciliation. That, that's the idea. If one of the two has remarried, then the other is free to remarry. Reconciliation is no longer possible. Okay? So, so what do we do with this? I, this is two believers we're talking about here. We've talked about this at length, so I don't, I don't want to beat a dead dog. What I want to do is um, 
I want to try to make some application of these principles today if I can, okay? So bear with me on this. Uh, Reconciliation for two believers. Why is that the course? Why is that mandatory to attempt reconciliation? Well, the reason why is because of the resources that are available to believers. Unbelievers, down in the second section, they don't have the same resources that believers do at their disposal, right? Right? I mean, let's talk about the resources that we have available for just a moment. There's seven of them. First, I think of God the Father, right? We have God the Father on our side. Uh, As believers, we've been reconciled to God. God is sovereign, and I think if we can view our situation and we can say, listen, uh, God has brought these problems even into our life for a purpose. Uh, Romans 8, right? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, and who are called according to His purpose. So we have God on our side. Uh, Is He sovereign or not? True or false? God is sovereign. And so for us to say that somehow we need to undo what God has joined together as believers, I think is a wrong mindset. I really do. A second resource, the indwelling Spirit. Uh, You have the same power available to you internally uh, that enabled martyrs to endure burning at the stake, uh, being fed to lions, right? You have the same power at your disposal indwelling you as all the martyrs through all the centuries. Can you endure a little heartache with your spouse? I, I think the answer is yes. As believers, we ought to be able to, right? Third, you have the Advocate, Jesus Christ the Righteous, who sits at the right hand of the Father, right? Interceding on our behalf. The Art spoke to that here at Communion. We have Christ uh, there raised up in the heavens at the right hand of the Father, uh, making intercession always for us. You've got Christ praying for you. And uh, Ephesians 2 would tell us that we're raised up with Him there. So our mindset Uh, should be one that we have uh, the entire Trinity, in a sense, on our side. Uh, Can you you fail with that? I don't don't think so. Uh, I think think we can, but I think maybe it's because we haven't looked at the resources that we have available. But the Scriptures, uh, 2 Peter 1, right, tells us that we have everything pertaining to to life and godliness, right? His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We have the Scriptures. We have the Word of God to renew our minds and to help us uh, to relate to God and to understand His will for our lives. We have the Scriptures. We have the church. We have the church. We have other believers available for comfort, for encouragement, Uh, to bear truth on our lives. We have the fellowship of the saints. We have counseling. We have leadership in the church that can help. Uh, The church is here for us, right? They're family. And so you're not alone. You can have help from the church. Six, uh, restorative church discipline. And I do say restorative because that's the purpose of church discipline. We don't want to we don't want to abuse that. We want to understand the church discipline is, is the idea of restoring one who is straying back to the fellowship. Uh, the idea here is repentance and restoration. We want to win them back to the fellowship. So we have that. You have that at your disposal as well for your good. And lastly, I think about this is the idea of forgiveness. You know, you have been forgiven much, right? Right? And because we have been forgiven, we have the ability to forgive. That is a powerful resource, beloved. The ability to forgive is not something that the unbelieving community really has the ability to do. But to believers, they have the ability to forgive one another truly. And that, Ephesians 4, 31, 32, is the power of the gospel. You have been forgiven in Christ, and I would say you have an obligation to forgive because of that. So these are the resources that we have as believers, and and you ought to understand 
that two believers who divorce, it's essentially causing a church split in micro. It's a church split because, uh, right, you have the Spirit, the same Spirit indwells both of you that indwells the entire church, right? And this is why God hates divisiveness in the church, because it separates something which should not be separated. And divorce, in essence, does the same thing. It separates part of the church, which God has established the unity of the church through His Spirit. So for you to separate, in a sense, is doing something undoing or damaging what God has brought together. Right? God's Spirit, can it be divided? Should it be divided? Can or should God be divided? What about the picture of Christ and the church, uh, His bride? Could you, can you separate Christ from the church? I, I think we know the answer to these things. I just think we need to think long and hard on them before we advocate or enter into a divorced state. We really should give some strong consideration to these truths. Right? The second situation, this will take a little more effort to get through, uh, verses 12 to 16. This is a, a, a married couple, and it's a believer and an unbeliever. And as I said, the, in this situation, the, the couple uh, must have married as unbelievers. Uh, let's just say on the front side, there is no allowance, no warrant biblically to ever marry an unbeliever. Uh, if you do that, you will regret the day you do it. Don't do it. But for two unbelievers, and we've seen this before, right? One of them comes to faith, and the other one takes a while or never comes to the faith. So what happens in that situation? That's what, that's what Paul is addressing here, and the rules change because the unbeliever doesn't have the same resources that the believer has at their disposal. They just don't. They don't have the indwelling spirit. They don't know God the Father. They don't have Christ advocating for them. They don't understand the Scriptures. They don't come to church. They don't have any of those, any of those blessed um, resources at their disposal. Now look at that phrase there. He says, uh, to the rest I say, not the Lord. And as I said, Paul is covering a situation here which Christ never talked about during his three-year earthly ministry. This never was in the possible uh, scenario here. And he was addressing specific issues with the Pharisees. And I think I've wanted to say that for a while now, that uh, the information that we have in the Bible on divorce and remarriage, uh, there's no silver bullet, all one golden teaching moment on the issue. It's a conglomerate of information that has to be brought together from all over the Scriptures, and most of the times we hear about it, they're in corrective situations where somebody uh, has misunderstood the issue of marriage. And so it's corrective type of teaching. So, so here's the hypothetical scenario. Uh, a couple marries as unbelievers, yet one comes to faith later. So, so what do you do? What do you do with an unbelieving spouse? Well, Paul says you are not allowed to send them away. And the word there is the word for divorce. If they want to stay, obviously with certain provisions, right? We're not talking about here... Uh, sexual immorality or, or, they've, or they're somehow violating their marital covenant. Uh, they're abusive or something like that. Uh, if they want to stay and they want to stay peacefully, then Paul says, you need to let them stay. You need to let them stay and you need to minister to them. You need to minister the gospel to them. And I, I'm going to talk about the abuse situation later, so I'm shelving that for right now. So that was... Uh, that was a lot of the questions that came in on this topic were related to abuse. What do you do? What do you do? So I hope we'll be able to explain and answer that for you later. So hang in there. Uh, verses 12 and 13, look at that with me. Uh, two possible scenarios. First, verse 12, a believing husband who's married to an unbelieving wife. 
The second scenario is a believing wife who's married to an unbelieving husband. You see that, verse 13. Uh, So Paul is saying here, it's not permissible to divorce them simply because they're unbelievers. That's not grounds for a divorce. You can't do that. Uh, In and of itself, unbelief is not scripturally permissible grounds to divorce. Uh, As I said, only if there's other issues involved, uh, other violations of the covenant. And the reason is in verse 14. Uh, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. This is where it starts to get really hard to understand what this passage is talking about. I think the bottom line here, as I study this out, that the believer is essentially the only Christian testimony in the home. And out of the two spouses, it would be better to have one believer there in the home than no believers there in the home, right? That's the point, that the children, uh, which would be better, being raised by two rank pagans or having a believer in the home and a rank pagan in the home. I I think it's a no-brainer, and we know the truth that the children would have some exposure, at least, to the gospel through the believing parent. That's That's the issue here, and I think having a believer present in the home can be a powerful influence on on not only the unbelieving spouse, but on the children. That's what Paul is saying. Now, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, I think is instructive here. Why Why don't you turn over there and let's look at that. Now, 1 Peter 3 is addressing, again, a particular situation in the church, um, and, and he, you see that phrase in verse 1, in the same way, uh, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands. See that? And then you see that down in verse 7, you husbands in the same way uh, live with your wives in an understanding way. Well, in the same way as what? In the same way as what? Well, if you look back up to 1 Peter 2, uh, it's in the same way that Christ submitted to His heavenly Father. He entrusted Himself to God to do rightly. Uh, In the same way, you wives submit. In the same way, you husbands submit. Uh, And the idea here is submitting to God in the present situation that you find yourself in. Uh, 3, 1 to 6 is talking about the wifely submission. And I want you to notice, in particular, uh, verse 6. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now, when you look at the Old Testament and you ask yourself, when exactly was the context that, that Abraham's wife called him Lord? And it was clearly, uh, one of the, the only reference you can find is, is when Abraham was passing her off as his sister, right? And she had to submit to Abraham on that issue twice, and he put her in a jeopardizing situation where where she could have been compromised in their marriage. And even in that, the Scripture says, she could have won him over by submitting to what he asked her to do. It's food for thought. It's food for thought. Uh, what we're talking about here is the possibility of, of sacrificing your own rights. And I'm not talking about if your life is in jeopardy or something, okay? Let's shelf that for just a moment. I'm saying uh, there may be trials in the road for you. There may be difficulties in the home. Uh, it may be sacrificing your own rights to a happy marriage uh, with a view to the salvation or the sanctification of your own husband. God may require that of you. He may require you to suffer a little for your spouse to come to faith. So so let me just ask you a question this morning. What's more important to you? Is it your happiness and your fulfillment, or is it the eternal salvation of your spouse? I mean, you need to think long and hard on that before you pull the trigger on a divorce. You're the believer in the situation. You may be the only gospel witness there, and God may be calling you to suffer a little. 
And so, which is more important to you? The salvation of your lost spouse or your own happiness and fulfillment? I think this is where verse 16 comes into play uh, back in 1 Corinthians 7 where he says, how do you know if you'll save your husband? How do you know, O husband, whether you're going to save your wife? You don't know. You don't know what the Lord could do through you and your gospel witness in the home. I think the exception to this is verse 15, and that is abandonment. The the exception here, uh, if the unbelieving one leaves, Paul says, let him leave. If they want to leave, let them leave. He says the brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Abandonment breaks the relational exclusivity component of the marriage. They they break the covenant. They leave the premises. They're gone. They've abandoned the covenant. They don't want to be married anymore. Technically, uh, when a person leaves, they break the sexual exclusivity side of the covenant as well, right? They're not around anymore. How can they fulfill their obligations where Paul says in verse 5, stop depriving one another? There's nothing you can do. Again, this chapter is about celibacy, right? There's nothing you can do if they've left. You're not under bondage. You can't be held to your end of the covenant when there's nobody fulfilling their other half of the covenant, right? What do you do? Now, I I would say that you're no longer bound. I would not run out and marry, you know, divorce and remarry right away. Uh, I would let some time pass. you know, you don't run out and marry the following week, right? Click your heels and go, Yahoo, I'm free again. Um, you should give it a reasonable amount of time to see if they come back or not, right? Maybe they're, maybe they're off and maybe they're having a crisis and they're working things through and they're processing it. Maybe the God's on, at work on them and they're going to come back to you. You don't, you don't want to have them come back and find that they've remarried, Right? Uh, find that you don't want to have them come back and find that you've remarried. Say that better. That would not be good, right? So, so let's think about this abandonment clause here for a moment. This does not mean that you pray for them to leave. Okay? This does not mean that you start fervently praying, that's my way out. I'm going to start praying that they will leave. That's the wrong mindset, beloved. It's the wrong mindset. It does not mean that you make life so miserable for them that they want to leave. That's not the right mindset either. It does not mean that you scheme and that you come up with a plan to get them to leave. Uh, It does mean that if they want to leave, you should let them leave and let them do it peacefully. Don't drag them through the mud. Don't pull it into the court system. Don't make a big harassing deal out of it. Don't make them hate Christianity because of your actions while they're leaving. Okay? The guiding principle here, verse 15, God has called us to peace. Okay? Now the us here is believers, right? This is a Romans 12, 18 thing. So far as it 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 depends on you, be at peace with all men. Uh, Notice that Paul is saying it's for us as believers, and they're not a believer. You're the believer. You need to keep peace. If they want to leave, let them leave, but you're part of the camp of the redeemed. Uh, God has called us to peace, so if a spouse who is angry about you being a believer wants to get away from you, let them go. Let them go. Uh, I think this is the point where I need to say this is where the church needs to be involved. This is where the church has to step in. Uh, They need to get involved for your protection, for your protection. Uh, If one wants the protection of the church, they need to allow us into the situation. If one of the two is acting like a 
functional unbeliever, let's call them that, then they need to be declared that by the church. The church needs to be the one to say, this person is an unbeliever and they're out. Okay? And, and the reason why is because the two parties involved in the marriage have lost their neutrality. They're no longer neutral. There's no Switzerland here, right? This is World War II, and there's no neutral party. The church it needs to come in objectively and look at all the facts and try to come up with an answer. And the church, beloved, is the only one with the authority to do that. The church is the only one with the authority to do that. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. The elders of the church are able to bring to the situation wisdom, perspective, experience, counsel, prayer. They can bring all these things to a situation where the parties involved have completely lost their neutrality. You want the elders involved in that for your own protection. So let's talk about some possible scenarios, shall we? This is where it gets hard. This is the minefield. Let's say there's an unbeliever and a believer. They're married, and the unbeliever outright leaves the marriage. They just leave. Let me say for, for whatever reason, perhaps they've become involved in illegal drugs and they're arrested, uh, or they're consistently absent from the home, they're thrown in jail, they're gone all the time, they're functioning like an unbeliever, maybe they're off on drinking binges all the time, they never bring the money home to the family, they rarely make it home. Uh, perhaps one spouse has run off with another person, uh, the unbelieving spouse. Uh, whatever the reason, one of the two has abandoned or left the marriage or they're gone, I don't know, you want to give a percentage, they're gone most of the time. Is the other person bound to remain in that kind of a situation? And I think, beloved, the answer based on verse 15 is no. They're not under bondage in those situations. I don't believe they are. The other person has abandoned the marriage covenant of relational exclusivity, which had the component of being present, right? And, and they're, they're not committed to the marriage covenant. So, no, the, the one that remains is free to divorce and to remarry because this is an unbeliever in the situation that we're talking about. And the church, this is what I'm saying, the wisdom of how and when needs to be considered and worked through with the church leadership. They need to evaluate the situation. They need to declare that person a functional unbeliever. And then the grounds of chapter 6 come into play where you can then sue them for a divorce because they're an unbeliever. Which, by the way, you can't sue another believer, so that's another reason why you should not divorce as believers. Okay? I told you, this is a minefield. This gets hard. This gets hard. Abandonment of the covenant without leaving the home. I've heard questions about that. Can somebody abandon the covenant without leaving the home? And I think uh, in this situation, let me just, here's the hypothetical. An unbeliever is denying their spouse conjugal rights. They're uh, refusing counsel, they're, they're hating their spouse, they're unwilling to work on the marriage, there's no peace in the home. They've abandoned both covenants of the, of the covenant of companionship, the unbeliever has, the, the relational and the sexual exclusivity obligations to their mate. Uh, is the Christian spouse free to divorce and remarry? Are they free? And the answer is, I believe, yes. I believe they are. But, with this caveat, only after every attempt has been made at reconciliation. 
We want to preach the gospel to that unbeliever. We want to talk to them. We want to try to counsel them. We want to bring them to faith if we can. But if after everything else has failed and this person is refusing counsel, beloved, they don't want to be in the home. They're just too gutless to leave. And I think we as a church have an obligation to step in. And it would be nice if we were invited in. This person is acting like a functional unbeliever, and they need to be declared so by the leadership of the church. And then again, you have the ability to sue them for a divorce. Again, this is, understand, this is the nuclear option, and this is why this is hard for me, because I would, this is like the last option that you go to, not the first option. This is like after everything else has failed, this is where we go. We got nowhere else to go, Right? But I don't believe that, here's the marriage covenant, right? Again, this takes place in the context of the sexual union. Uh, Paul is saying the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. The husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Uh, Stop depriving one another. In other words, uh, you have marital obligations to one another, and if you're living with a spouse who is not fulfilling those obligations to you, and you married them for that purpose, and they're defrauding you, then, beloved, you're not sentenced to a death sentence here. Okay? It's, that's, that's unbiblical to force somebody into a life of hell like that. It's not what they signed up for. Uh, and the whole point of being married is so that they won't burn with passion, Right? And again, I'm, I'm treading lightly here because I'm, I'm not encouraging anybody to that. I'm just saying it exists as an option if we need it. By the way, uh, I'm not talking about emotional abandonment here, okay? I've heard that expression. That's a psychological term that promotes selfishness. I am not talking about emotional abandonment. What I am talking about is somebody is not fulfilling their covenant obligations to their mate. That's a, there's a big difference there. It's not that you're just unhappy. That's not grounds to get out. Unhappiness is not grounds for a divorce. Okay? All right, here's the one that, here's the one that's, I think, probably the most painful for most people. What about physical or sexual abuse of the wife or children? Okay? Assault, physical battery, abuse, sexual abuse. Those are all crimes, beloved, that are illegal, aren't they? They're illegal. So what do you do? You pick up the phone and you call the police. You call the police, you have the legal system intervene, you have the person arrested. They're committing a crime, and they're choosing the crime over your marriage covenant. Okay? It's illegal. Uh, Innocent parties should protect themselves by every means possible. I would never tell somebody to stay in a marriage where the children were being abused or the wife was being beaten to death. They need to protect themselves. They need to call the police. Those things are illegal. And in the natural course of events, that person is going to be arrested, right? They're going to be arrested. They're going to be put in prison. And when they're put in prison, they can no longer fulfill what? Their marriage vows. They can no longer fulfill their covenant uh, commitments to relational and sexual exclusivity to their spouse. They're no longer in the home. At that point, free to divorce. And the reason why is because this person is acting like a functional unbeliever. And they're choosing illegal activity over the marriage covenant. And I do not believe that the spouse must stay under bondage in that situation. The believing spouse does not need to. But again, here's the caveat. The leadership of the church needs to be involved in walking a person through this situation. You should not do this on your own. That person needs to be declared an unbeliever by the church leadership, and we can move forward from there. 
Now, let me just say, our culture is so psychologized now that anything and everything qualifies as abuse and grounds for a divorce. And I would say that is not, that is not true. That is not true. Uh, many say they're emotionally abused. He's not nice to me, right? Or he mistreated me, or I'm not happy. And then they use that as a justification for their divorce. That is not a valid reason, beloved. Most of those excuses are flimsy, they're unbiblical, and they're not justifiable for a divorce. I think they're actually a smokescreen for people just wanting out. They've made up their mind that they're not happy and they want out and they deserve happiness. And so once you start down that road, you start plotting your escape. Okay? That's not the biblical mindset. Let me just conclude by saying this. It would, you know, it would be nice. I've, I've tried to emphasize this. You know, folks want the church there on the front side of their marriage, but they tend to not want them there on the end of their marriage. You know what I'm saying? It would be nice if the leadership of the church were sought out before the divorce papers are being signed. Right? Before you've called the lawyers and you've uh, gone into arbitration and you're figuring out who's going to get the house. It would be nice if the church were involved to try to help you reconcile before you get to that nuclear option. But no, more often than not, we're the last ones that are called. We're the last ones that are called. And, and, and in, in that situation, it leaves us little opportunity to try to fix what's broken. It's ca- calling us in at the last minute to pick up the pieces after everything has been destroyed. Uh, it's a pretty tough situation to work with. You know what I'm saying? Do you call your doctor when you're at stage four of cancer? The time to call him is when you're just seeing symptoms of problems, right? Uh, The first signs of trouble, you come and you get help. Uh, Ignoring the symptoms are not going to make, it's not going to make the cancer go away. It's going to get worse. Uh, What I'm encouraging you to here is to use the resources at your disposal now if you're having trouble. Now. Now. There's leadership, there's counseling, there's elders. There's, we can be praying for you. We can be walking you through this situation. Don't feel like you've got to go it alone. We're here for you. The church is here for you. As we have said time and again, as we looked at this passage this morning, there is sin involved in all divorce. We know that. But, beloved, not all divorce is is sinful. I think as a church, we need to be more compassionate to those who are going through such a difficult, difficult place of life. Let's pray. Our Father, human sin accounts for so many of the problems that we find ourselves in and we know that our hearts are often distant from you. And Father, I can only pray that this morning we would not have a high view of divorce, but a high view of marriage. Father, that we would only see divorce as a, as a last option, but it is a valid option when necessary. And that, Father, we would find ourselves more and more coming under the authority of your Scriptures. That, Father, your Spirit would be Uh, conforming us to the image of Christ and renewing our minds that we might make our marriage everything that it is supposed to be rather than trying to figure out a way out. Father, may You bring Your Scriptures to bear. May they shed light in our hearts. May they guide our paths and our footsteps. Father, we give ourselves to You this morning and pray that You would work in our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed, beloved. God bless you this morning.